morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. It's a beautiful day. Not too hot. Not too cold. <laughs> we don't get the cold in Belize. But a uh, beautiful day to come together as a church and, uh, and worship Him. And this morning we are studying, or uh, finishing really the book of Ecclesiastes. The last two chapters and we're going to be wrapping it up. I hope we can do justice to the book and uh, wrap it up in a way that uh, makes sense as we really kind of come to the conclusion of what uh, Solomon comes to at the end of his of his uh, voyage, we could say, of seeking for purpose and meaning in life. In August 3rd, in 1492, Christopher Columbus set sail across the Atlantic. And 69 days later, on October 12th, 1492, he found America. Solomon, in a sense, we could say, has launched out on a voyage to find meaning in life. He's tried everything. He's tried everything the world had to offer. He tried materialism, pleasure, morality, but it left him empty. But we see in chapter 10 that his ship is beginning to head in the right direction. He has looked in all the wrong places and he's not found meaning. But now his ship is beginning to head to point in the right direction. And maybe to some degree this is a voyage that we all can relate to to some degree. We have sought truth. We've sought meaning, fulfillment in life. And maybe many of us have found it. We found that deep relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe there's some that are kind of searching to this day. But I think it's something that we can all relate to. We've all been on this voyage looking for meaning and looking for purpose, looking for fulfillment. What is it that God desires of my life? And so today we'll see where, where the port is, really, that Solomon, where he lands with his ship. Beginning in chapter 10, verse 1, Dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. Now chapter 10, there's a little bit of a change in that chapter 10 and 11 is a little bit more like Proverbs. There's just a, you know, some short sayings, some of them not really related to the others. And uh, so it's just, it kind of reverts back to Proverbs. I think it's the ship is beginning to point in the right direction. He's kind of coming back to his senses because he wrote the book of Proverbs when he was doing well. And, uh, and then he kind of drifted and now he's kind of coming back to his senses. So it's kind of, he's kind of picking up the mood of, of Proverbs. But this proverb says that someone may be known for his reputation, but then a little bit of foolishness and it does so much damage. Maybe a rash decision, like Esau, with one swipe sold his birthright. Or Moses, hitting the rock when he should have been speaking to it. Or Aaron, the great high priest, and then he makes the golden calf. Or Peter denying Jesus. But we see that people of reputation can ruin it in just a swipe. And maybe Solomon feels a little bit like this. He had made some foolish moves and he's kind of trying to claw his way back to some form of, of meaning again in life. In verse 2, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Now, it's just, I think that's just kind of cultural. You know, the right hand in Solomon's day was regarded to be the site of strength and skill and favor. So the wise man's heart was considered to be on his right. And then it's not true for a fool. He, he, it's the opposite, whose heart is considered to be on the left. Now, obviously, that doesn't matter today. It's not, I don't think it's a cultural thing back in the day. Verse 3, even when a fool walks like along the way, he lacks wisdom. 
and he shows everyone that he is a fool. Kind of goes with Proverbs 17 says, Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he's considered perceptive. And I think that's true. Sometimes people, you think they're wise until they open their mouth. And you realize, well, maybe not. <laughs> and so, uh, verse 4, If the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post. For conciliation pacifies great offenses. See, when, when the ruler gets mad, when your boss gets angry at you, don't quit your job. Just stay calm, continue your work, and work it out. Learn from it, and move on. See, some people, as soon as the going gets tough, they quit. I'm out of here. I don't like it. Solomon would say, don't do that. Stick it out. Learn from hard times. Get stronger. See, those that keep hopping from place to place in their job, they miss out on the opportunity to grow, to work things out. Make it work. Humble yourself. Make changes necessary to make things work. It's important in life. If we want to move forward or move ahead in life, in any way in life, it can be in your family, it can be in your marriage, it can be at your job, it can be spiritually, you must learn to work with others. You must learn teamwork. Otherwise, you won't get far in life. The reason most people fail in life is because they don't get along with people. And the hardest thing in the world is to get along with people. But we must learn to do that. Stick it out. Work it out. And often what it requires is humility. And so Solomon says, don't quit. Stick in there. Work it out. Grow. Verse 5, there is an evil... There is an evil I have seen under the sun as an heir proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity while the rich sit in a lonely place, lowly place. I have seen servants on horses while princes walk on the ground like servants. What he's saying is, uh, what I'm observing, Solomon says, that life is not fair. The servant rides on a horse and the prince walks on the ground. Doesn't make sense. It's not fair. Some foolish people are promoted and given positions of leadership while wise men, noble men, are given low positions. Life is not fair. Simple as that. Sometimes the kids will say, It's not fair. And sometimes we can make it fair, but life isn't fair. Life will not always be fair to you. We will see good people suffer, while godless people just kind of seem to glide through life. You know, we live in a fallen world, and life just, just doesn't treat us fairly. And the sooner we learn that, the better. The answer to, to happiness should not be whether something is fair. It must be rooted in something deeper. Jesus wasn't treated fairly. Jesus did everything right. And he ended up being crucified. We look at Joseph. He did everything right. Since he was a kid, he did everything right. And he was treated wrong. So life isn't fair. Or happiness has to be rooted in something deeper than how we're treated. Solomon will get to that in just a couple chapters. Verse 10. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength, but wisdom brings success. Now this is common sense. Cutting down a tree with a dull axe requires much strength. The time needed to sharpen the axe is well spent. Now, the, the fool, he just keeps chopping away, but the wise person, he stops and he sharpens the axe. This can happen to you, it can happen to me in life. 
where our acts becomes dull. It can happen in your life, your everyday life. It can happen in your marriage. It can happen in your spiritual life. Your acts becomes dull. And you have to stop and sharpen. Personally, I think in my life, that's one of the things I have to always struggle with. To take enough time to sharpen the axe. Just keep going, just keep going, just keep moving ahead and working and preparing sermons and just, 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 but to take the time to sit back, take time off to reflect, pray, and sharpen the axe. It's necessary. We must do it. For us to be effective in life, for us to be able to accomplish what God has accomplished us to do, we must sharpen the axe. Verse 16. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness because of, laz of laziness the building decays and through idleness of hands the house leaks a feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry but money answers everything now I think Solomon here speaks in the voice of the wicked the unwise king along this line he counsels his readers not to curse the king lest they be found out in the voice of the wicked, money answers everything. He's speaking from that perspective. Now, going to chapter 11, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to, ser to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Now, casting your bread upon many waters... Maybe it's a reference to Solomon shipping grain throughout uh, many countries in his day. His venture that Solomon had with his ships, his fleet of ships, hauling grain and hauling timber. These in re investments require great patience. There were much work, there was much investment with a return that could not be immediately seen. It's a long-term investment, we could say. He could also be speaking of generosity. Uh, you know, you give in a way that may even seem wasteful. You just scatter it. And uh, you cast it on many waters, but eventually down the road, there will be a reward that, that is not immediately seen. It's a long-term investment. This is what Jesus said. He said it along the same line in Luke 6. He says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put in your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. It's probably what he has in mind. Just when it comes to investment, give. Invest. And, you know, it'll be, it'll, it'll be a, a long time investment, but it'll, it'll come back. Or the same thing, giving. When you give from your heart, you may not see the results right away, but eventually it'll pay off. Verse 3, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. Now I think in his thought process here, Solomon is now, he's, he, he's reasoning really from the idea of cause and effect. The idea of cause and effect directs us to eternity for many questions will never, never be answered on this side of eternity. You can ask, ask certain questions, but it, it, it doesn't do justice. See, the, the wickedness of man or the goodness of man in this earthly life can never be fully explained. We, we must wait for eternity. So, the necessary effect, really, from cause and effect is realized 
only in eternity. That's really, I think, what he's, he's trying to relate here. Verse 4, he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. See, the, the farmer who is overly analytical about the weather will never plant his fields. Because it looks like, oh, it's not going to rain this year. Looks like it's going to be a dry year, so I'm not going to plant. Or it looks like it's going to be flooded, so I'm not going to plant. If he's overly analytical, then you know, he's just, just not going to plant. And if he doesn't plant, he will not harvest the crop. See, I think Solomon is pushing back a little bit on that idea to be overly analytical. See, if we must know everything before we make an investment, we won't invest. If we must know every detail, how our money will be spent before we give, then we will never give. Now, Jesus said, he who builds a tower, he must count the cost. You know, we evaluate, we count the cost, we seek counsel, and then we move forward as, as deems the best. But you can't know everything. There's always an element of risk. See, some things you can never explain on this side of eternity. And that's why eternity is necessary. For example, thinking about being over-analytical. Just for example, Moses and the rock in the wilderness. Just one example. Moses hit the rock. And God said, because you didn't speak to the rock, because you hit it, you cannot enter the promised land. If Moses had not hit the rock, and he had been obedient, he had spoken, would he have entered the promised land? I don't think so. I don't see how. Because Moses is a representative of the law. The law can never enter the promised land. It's impossible. It has to be, the law can only bring you to the Jordan River. But it has to be Joshua, Joshua, Christ, grace, that takes you over into the promised land. So God says, you hit the rock, you can't enter. But he had not hit the rock, he wouldn't have entered. There are so many things like that in the Bible. If you're overly analytical, you, it, it's, some of these things, just you can never figure them out. There's somehow the sovereignty of God is interwoven in all of this. In such a way that our finite minds can never comprehend and fully understand how it works. If Judas had responded to the call of Christ during the Last Supper, would he not have been crucified? He would have been crucified. How do you, I don't know how you explain it. I don't understand it. It's the sovereignty of God. That is why eternity is absolutely necessary. This life can never explain all of the mysteries of life. Cause and effect can only be analyzed to some degree. And then the rest must be left for eternity. Verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind... Or how the bones grow in the womb of her, of her who is with child. So you do not know the works of God who makes everything. So basically he's saying there are certain things that just kind of defy explanation. You just can't figure it out. Just kind of like the child in the womb of a mom. You can't, you cannot just, it just cannot be explained. Verse 6, in the morning sow your seed. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper. Either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Truly, the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for there will be many. All that is coming is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove the sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for the childhood and youth 
our vanity. So in verse 9, Solomon can, can kind of see the shoreline of his journey, we could say. He starts coming to a frame of mind where he can make sense of what really matters in life. If you look in verse 9, he says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Now he starts this section with the word rejoice. Rejoice in your youth. Now perhaps Solomon thinks back to his youth. And that is what he desired in life was to rejoice, to be happy. This is what all youth desire. That's what we all desire is to rejoice and to be happy. This is also what God desires for men. He made men and set them in the garden so that men might rejoice. Enjoy his presence in the garden. Now Solomon in his conclusion sees that there is a place for enjoyment in life. The meaning of life is not found in pleasure. But the meaning of life is neither found in asceticism or self-denial. It's important that we understand that. The meaning of life will never be found in pleasure. So then we'll go the opposite way. We'll find meaning in asceticism, in self-denial. It's not found there either. See, when we understand that there is more to life than what our natural eye can see, that there is an eternity and an eternal God to reckon with, then the legitimate pleasures of life can be enjoyed. See, when we understand that there is eternity coming and that we will give judgment for everything that we've done, at that point, enjoyment simply becomes a seasoning in our life. It's not a destination. I like what Kidner said. He said it this way, in this frame of mind, we can now turn to the delights of life, not as if it were opiates to tranquilize us, but as invigorating gifts of God. So for a man to enjoy life, you must first come to the realization that there is more to life than what we see with our natural eye. That there is an eternity. And that we will give an account for everything that we've done. Once we come to that realization, then we can enjoy life. In, in a good sense. And the pleasure that God has given us to enjoy now becomes a seasoning in our life. Something that invigorates. Something that adds to the enjoyment of our walk as we go through life. So meaning is not found in enjoyment. Meaning is not found in self-denial. It's only found in the fact that there's an eternity and that we will give an account for everything that we've done. Rab, who was a, a Jewish scholar, 300 years after Jesus, this is what he said. Man will give an account for all that he saw and did not enjoy. Man will give an account for all that he saw and did not enjoy.
when we have our foot set in the right place, when our voyage has come to an end and we have found our footing on the rock which is Jesus Christ, and we stand on that rock and that is our meaning, that is our purpose, that is our fulfillment in life, we can now look at the world and we can look at the certain things that God has placed in a good sense and we can enjoy it. We can enjoy nature. We can enjoy food. We can enjoy so many things in life and it's good. It's not our meaning. It's not our purpose. It just adds and it invigorates our life. The last part of verse 9 says, Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. So here is kind of the antidote the, or the antithesis for under the sun living. Life is not just lived for the here and now, under the sun, but also for eternity. It's lived for above the sun. See, God will one day judge everything that has been done under the sun. I like what, what uh, Mr. Guzik has to say about this. He says, His judicial activity is not the type of the blindfolded maiden holding a balance in her hand on the cold, neutrali or the, the cold neutrality of an impartial judge, but is rather the consuming energy in which God must bring about right. God will judge different. So the fact that every action of every man will be judged on the day that we stand before God brings a sense of meaning to everything that happens under the sun. Verse 10. Therefore remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh for childhood and youth are vanity. See, living a life in view of eternity and eternal God gives us hope for this life and for the life to come. It gives us hope. It removes sorrow from our heart. It says here, for childhood and youth are vanity. See, when we live for under the sun only, then childhood and youth are all that matters. But when we live a life in light of eternity, then that no longer holds true. Chapter 12, verse 1, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Solomon says, See God when you are young. See, habits are formed early in life. When we learn to walk with God early in life, it'll pay dividends for the rest of our lives. For we have developed good habits, such as reading the Bible or praying, going to church, having fellowship, spending time with other believers. When we develop that early on in our life, it'll be so much easier when we get older. I was looking at the International Bible Society. They did a survey not too long ago. and They found out that 83% of Christians make, up, make their first commitment to Jesus Christ in the ages from 4 to 14. Now, there's different, there, there's different surveys out there. And they they're vary a little bit. But there's one thing that they all have in common. That the vast majority of people that come to Christ come to Christ before the age of 20. The vast majority of them. So when you're young, that's an important time to hone your life for us as parents to teach our children, to, 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 to disciple them early and point them to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to these. See, that is why in this church we focus on children. Children ministry is more than just child care. It's ministry. We teach the children. We instruct the children. We train the children in the things of the Lord. 
but it's first and foremost it should be done in the home. Take it serious because it's when your child is young that it's important that he finds the right path that his ship we could say is pointed in the right direction. It'll be so much easier when he gets older and when he's set in his ways. See we have habits and sometimes we look at habits as a negative thing but it can be a positive thing when you have positive habits in your life. Getting up, reading the Bible, spending time with the Lord, going to work, you know, you come back, you spend some more time with the Lord. Good, you can develop good habits. Oh, going to church whenever I feel like it. Being in fellowship when I feel like it. There's habits that we can develop that are unhealthy. And in long term, they pay dividends, but not in a good way. But when we teach our children early on, it'll pay dividends for the rest of their life. And now Solomon begins to talk about old age. So he says, when you're young, seek God. Before the difficult day is gone, before you get old. Verse 2, he says, while the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not turn after the rain, and the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets, and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of music are brought low, also they are afraid of height and of terrors, and way when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden, and desire fails, for a man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Now, when you just read it like that, you might not get much. But let me just break it apart just a little bit for us, for us to get it. In verse 3, the keepers of the house tremble. Now, he's talking about your body. The arms and the hands that keep the body now begin to tremble when you get older. Verse 3, the strong men bow down. The legs and the knees begin to sag. Grinder sees because they are few. Latter part of verse 3. He's speaking about the teeth. The teeth are lost and chewing becomes difficult. The windows grow dim. He's talking about the eyes. You can't see well. Verse 4. The sound of grinding is low. The ears. That What he's saying is that the ears become weaker and weaker. You're not, you can't hear anymore. It's kind of like my ears. Verse 4. The second part, one rises up at the sound of a bird. Sleep becomes more difficult and you're easily awakened. Verse 4, letter part, the city, uh, the daughters of music are brought low. Singing and music are less appreciated. Verse 5, afraid of height and terrors in the way. One becomes fearful in life. Uh, and then he says, when the almond trees blossom. He's speaking of the hair becoming white. The grasshopper is a burden. And, well, you know, once you were active like a grasshopper, but now you're, you're weak. And then in verse 5, he says, desire fails. You know, the passions and desires of life, they weaken and they wane. That's what he's saying. He's talking about old age. This is how it works. It is a sad, in a sense, it is sad when human, that, that, that we as humans that we grow old. It was not God's initial plan. But, but God, man sinned and there's a fall and as a result, we grow old. It's really a sad thing when you think about it. A child is born and they grow up and you know, they're in the prime of their life and then their body starts falling apart. Your teeth start falling out and you can't hear anymore like myself and hair fall out and your bones begin to crack. But you know, Jesus came and he died on the cross for us. And today we put our faith in him. One day we will be redeemed. We will lay off this temporary tent that we're living in that's falling apart. And we will pick up a new body which will live forever and won't grow old again. It won't lose its teeth. I don't know if we have teeth in our new body, but, but it'll be different. And we will never grow old. And we will never be separated. No more death. So that's coming. 
Verse 6. <clears throat> Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. Could be a reference to the spinal cord or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. See, Solomon again pleads with his readers to remember God before life is over. Remember him before life advances and life becomes too complicated to allow God into your life. See, the drama of life, the broken bowls, the shattered pitchers, or the broken wheel, life can become so complex after a while if you don't have God in it that to let God in is hard. There's just too much drama in life. So he says, do it before. Do it before. So do it when you're young. See, but that does not mean that it's too late to start putting God first now. It's never too late. See, there have been many deathbed conversions. The thief on the cross was saved just before he died. So it's never too late. But it's, 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 it's so good if we can start it when we're young. But wherever you find yourself today, it's not too late. Put God first. Put him in your life. Make him first. And watch God put your life together. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And God can do that for all of us, for each one of us. He can make you completely new and fresh. He can take the drama out of your life. He can fix it. And he can make beauty from ashes. But we must come. We must come to him. Don't delay. Verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. Or body. You know. It's going to go back to the earth. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. And then he kind of compares this truth with you know, what he said before when he just started the book, of vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Apart from seeking God, apart from putting him first in your life, it's vanity. It's all vanity. Verse, verse 9, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words and what is, was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Basically what he's saying is pleasing words, fitting words, you know, like the book of Proverbs, have penetrating and life-changing effect. That's so true. When you think something through, when you pick your words carefully, they can be placed in such a way that people's lives are changed. But rash and, and, and ill thought of words can do the opposite. Verse 12. Any further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Amen to that. And let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment. There's an element of meaning in that. There's an element of meaning in that. That God will bring every action, every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So there you have it in a nutshell. Solomon tried everything, anything that sparkled in life, anything that looked appealing, he tried it, but it came back empty. And so I think it would be wise for us to learn from Solomon and to say, you know, I don't have to go down this rabbit trail. I don't have to try all these things that Solomon already tried and came back empty. I'll learn from Solomon's experience 
and avoid these pitfalls and go straight to the source, go straight to the meaning. Follow God and keep his commandments. Recently, I was flying transatlantic and if you've been down that route, <clears throat> I, I dreaded getting back on the plane because of the flight back. And 12 hours in a seat that's about 8 inches by 8 inches. And I don't know where you're supposed to put your feet, but it's like a torture chamber. And um, I got in the plane. And I walked down the aisle and I looked at my ticket and I saw that the number was pretty low. So that meant I was sitting pretty much in the back front of the plane. And they had upgraded me for some reason. And so I didn't have, you know, this, this, the bigger planes, you have three, three uh, uh, categories. You have the economy, you have the uh, premium, and you have first class. And so they upgraded me to premium. Now, if you, an economy... I call it the cattle section. It, it's, it's, you know, growing up on a farm, you know, you had a corral and, and you have cattle and there's, there's so much, you, 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 we couldn't get them all in the corral, but we just, you know, we chase them in and then with a couple people, we push the gate shut. You know, and the cattle are they're lifting their head, trying to find space, and, and they're there. It's like, kind of like a torture chamber. And, and that's the economy. And then you have, you know, the, the premium, which is, it's better. I mean, you, you can stretch your feet. It's nice. But it's kind of like purgatory, you know. It, it's, it, it, it's survivable. But because you look over just a little bit ahead of you, and then you have first class. You know, and they're their cubicle. They have their beds. It's like heaven. So you have this plane. And, and so you have the torture chamber, you have purgatory, or, or you can have it, you have heaven here in a sense. It's, it's all the same plane, the same pilot. Now, what's the difference between the seats? It's not your age. It's not your culture. It's not your race. There's only one difference between these seats, and that's the cost. What are you willing to pay? See, God has placed you in a plane. As believers, as Christians, we're on our way home. The question is, on which seat are you in? In Luke chapter 5, Jesus said to Peter, he said, launch your boat into the deep for a catch. We as Christians like to be in the shallow. We like to keep our feet on the shore. Jesus was in the boat and he was teaching to people who were standing on the shore with their feet on the ground. But Jesus said to Peter, go deep. See, whether you are shallow or whether you are deep and your relationship with God depends on the cost that you're willing to pay. If you want a deep relationship with Jesus Christ, it will cost you something. It means that you have to sharpen the axe. It means that you cannot just go with the flow and expect that your relationship with God is going to grow. It won't. You'll be an economy in the torture chamber, just along for the ride, enduring it. But if you want to go deep and you want to go first class with God, it means that you will have to be intentional about seeking the Lord in your life. If you are a parent with kids, that means that you might have to get up early in the morning when everybody else is still sleeping. 
If you are busy in other ways, it will be in different ways, but it always comes at a cost. It's never free. And so Solomon says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So go deep. Push out, launch out, and be willing to pay the cost for a deep relationship with our Lord. And when you do, your life is not just going to be a nice Christian. You're going to be deep. You're going first class. You're having that personal relationship with the Lord where your life is running over. And it's, it's not just your own fruit, but other people's lives are affected by the richness of your life. They're looking over from, from the torture chamber <laughs> to the first class and I, I, I wish I could be there. But you are willing to pay the cost. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for a book like Ecclesiastes, which is a bit complicated at, at places, but it's a book that teaches us something. That true meaning can only be found in one place and one source, and that is Jesus Christ. And help us, Lord, to be people who are willing to launch out deep. Where it's scary at times to really just give up our life and say, Lord, we are yours. But that's where life is found, and that is where fruit is found. That's where the fish are caught. And so, Lord, I pray that for all of us. Help us, Lord, to be people that go deep in Jesus' name.